recording right now. This is training for uh, uh, training for this San Francisco airport tenants on the San Francisco Integrated Pest Management Program. And uh, we will provide the link in case um, there are other staff that need to see this. So that's one of the advantages of being all virtual. We have to count our blessings these days. OK, so uh, what is IP? I'll start out with the basics. What is integrated pest management? It's not this. <laughs> um, uh, integrated pest management is really a common sense approach to managing pests, and that includes any organism you don't want around, whether they're rodents or weeds or whatever. And we think of it as a pyramid uh, where we spend most of our time at the base of the pyramid on things like prevention, better design and maintenance procedures, um, using physical controls when we can. And we save uh, pesticides for the last resort. And even then, we do a screening to find the safest uh, pesticides available for the purpose. And, you know, pesticides really includes insecticides and rodenticides and weed killers, uh, anything designed to kill something. So um, it's IPM is not, um, it's really a process. It's not a, a set of techniques. And, um, and it's really a, a way of making decisions about pest problems. And it's widely accepted as the best set of practices for pest management. So why do we, why are we concerned about it? Um, as you probably are aware, uh, there are a lot of potential health effects from all, all sorts of pesticides, especially asthma in interior spaces, um, uh, and a lot of uh, environmental effects, especially for, you know, facilities located right on the bay next to the marshes. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't all get taken out by the wastewater treatment plant. It makes it into the water um, and with things like rodenticides, um, there are some major wildlife impacts from rodenticides. Even though I realize you don't have uh, wildlife, hopefully, on the airport property, you do very close by. And um, so there, there are a lot of reasons why we latched early onto pesticides as an issue. And as a matter of fact, it was the founding program for our department way back in uh, something like 1996 is when the ordinance was passed. So that was the only program we had when we first started. Uh, it's had a long time to evolve. And I'm not going to go into details on this, but just trust me when I say that IPM as an approach has been well proven all over the world in terms of its health benefits, its effectiveness, um, and cost benefits. Usually there are higher costs the first year because you have to do more prevention and building things out um, and then lower costs thereafter. And, and, uh, and really effectiveness in get rid getting rid of pests. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's been proven this is the way to do it. Uh, what you will find, you all are running big operations out there, probably using contractors for your pest management. Oh, maybe we can talk about that. But um, <clears throat> the pest management companies don't always really do what is, um, let's say, don't always follow an IPM approach because they have a bottom line to look after. And we'll talk a little bit about that. IPM approach, and I'm just I'm going to rush through this, but it's really about knowing the biology of the pests, doing everything you can to prevent them, um, monitoring them looking to see if they're there before you do treatments. And this is this is something where the industry often doesn't bother with that. They'll put you on a spray calendar or a treatment calendar and say, hey, I'm going to visit once a month and do your treatment. Uh, <clears throat> but if there are no pests there, then a treatment may not be required. And um, really what's critical is to know what's going on in your facility. Uh, and I, I imagine that what a lot of you are dealing with are rodents. Uh, which we can talk a little more about later. Um, there are something something called action thresholds that apply to some pests, like let's say ants. If you have a couple of ants in your kitchen, is that enough to require a, a full-blown treatment? Or uh, is your threshold when there is a whole army of ants parading across the floor? So sometimes we don't need to treat, sometimes we do. And IPM also involves just using all the 
control methods in an integrated fashion um, and saving the bad stuff for last, saving the toxic stuff for last. And that's what our program is all about. Pop quiz. It's, this is so much easier when people are in the room. Name one IPM product. And usually someone raises their hand and, and then I say, you flunked because there's no such thing as an IPM product. It's not about the products, it's about the approach. So <clears throat> um, the way we, well, we spend a lot of our time on preventing pests in a systematic fashion. <clears throat> and this might be something good just to file away as facility managers, something to kind of watch for, especially if you have rodent problems in these big spaces. You're looking for things that every biological, every organism needs, food, water, a place to live, a way to get in in the first place. And then you're also looking for a way to inspect, like sometimes, for example, um, you're not able to see the foundation of a house, for example, to see if there are termites <clears throat> or, you know, investing, you, sometimes you're not able to find out if there are pests or not without going through a lot of destructive, uh, you know, um, interventions. So these are the basic principles on preventing pests. And we have actually worked with um, organizations all over the country <clears throat> a few years ago to pull together a set of guidelines for designing pests out of structures. And this might be something that's useful for some of your staff <clears throat> or contractors. <clears throat> it's a kind of a, um, an exhaustive guide with all sorts of fairly simple things that people need to look for and they forget to look for um, in their structures. And it's a way to reduce pest pressure for the life of the building if you do it right. So it's called Pest Prevention by Design. It's all on our website, it's all free. <clears throat> We're happy to talk to people about these things and I'll give you the links. Uh, this is now referred, by the way, in, in the, the, the US Green Building Council refers to these as part of its credit system. And, you know, as facility managers, you know, things you need to know only takes a half inch, the width of a dime, to let rats in. And it takes <clears throat> a quarter of an inch, the width of a pencil, to let mice in. And if you're going to do nothing else, if you have closed offices, I know a lot of your spaces are probably wide open, uh, but for the closed areas, looking for gaps and, and figuring out ways to close those gaps can solve a lot of problems. <clears throat> so that's kind of the extent that I'm gonna go into pest management in this presentation. What I think you're probably most interested in, in knowing is what's required for this program and how to, how to comply with it. So there is an ordinance, the IPM ordinance passed in 1996. It applies to all city-owned properties, including the airport. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, and here's what the ordinance requires. It, it, it does apply to leases, by the way. It applies to um, any leases that are, are newer than 1996. It requires an IPM approach in all operations, which is a pretty big general thing. Um, there are restrictions on pesticides that are citywide, and this is the maybe the number one thing you need to keep in mind when you're working with your contractors. We have a list of approved products, and if you do have to go to the last resort of using pesticides, they have to be on that list, and there are specific limitations on the list, and I'll talk about it in a moment. <clears throat> there is an exemption system for very special cases Usually, if you need a special product that's not on the list, I mean, you have to apply for an exemption. Generally, it's the department that does that. I'll leave that. You can discuss that with Jen. Uh, if if the case comes up, it probably won't. <clears throat> but there is a, a means to have exemptions. There are posting requirements that may not apply to you so much. I'll talk about those in a second. There are record keeping requirements that definitely apply to you all. Um, and that is, we have to keep records of all pesticides used on the city properties. Um, all exemption requests and all pesticide data is automatically public and it's actually posted on a public website. <clears throat> and there is an annual public hearing 
for anyone who's had exemptions, this is a sort of the accountability part of it to answer questions on why that was necessary. And this kind of keeps us all honest. It also keeps us in touch with what the community uh, is asking for. So this is a pretty well-established program. We think we've pretty much got it down. Um, um, and let's um, let me just talk about the restrictions on pesticides first. <coughs> Excuse me. Before we add any product to our list, it's called the reduced risk pesticide list. We put it through a hazard screening. It's a hazard screening that's very simple. One, two, three, system one is bad, three is not bad. And that helps us flag the products that we are targeting for removal from this list. There are still, we call them tier one, tier two, tier three products. And if you look at the reduced risk pesticide list, you'll see the tier ranking for all of these. So there is a big process behind this list. It is revisited, readjusted each year by a stakeholder group of, of professional IPM people here in the city, including contractors and city IPM specialists. So it's really based on reality. It's not um, people at Department of the Environment deciding you can't use this anymore. It's more about asking what's the safest way to do this. So the result is the reduced risk pesticide list, and I'll you know, give you the links and everything, um, updated each year, as I mentioned, and if you look at the list, and this is something you're going to have to follow, um, <clears throat> you'll see product names and EPA numbers, uh, ingredients, if that's of interest, the hazard tier that I just mentioned, one is bad, three is good. Uh, there's something called a use limitation, which is really kind of <clears throat> an extension of the hazard tier, but it's these are the ones that we're most concerned about, are the ones that say most limited. And then there are specific limitations, and this is the part you need to pay attention to, if nothing else, that is whether the pesticide is on the list and what the limitations are, because we're kind of like an additional layer of regulating these things. We we may only allow this product in one place, you know, one site, uh, for very spe specific reasons. So it's good to to be familiar with that for you and or your contractors. <coughs> Excuse me. You can find this and pretty much everything else you need on our webpage at sfenvironment.org slash IPM. And you'll click on the city departments link and you'll see all these tools um, for compliance, including a compliance checklist. And there's the list right there. The compliance checklist is kind of everything I'm telling you today, but it's in words. Uh, with a lot of extra info, um, probably way more than you need as leasees, <clears throat> but it's something that you can share with your pest management contractors. Um, and so I would recommend um, accessing that and having a look and having it available. Um, there are posting requirements for pesticide use on city properties, <clears throat> and that means telling people, you know, in the interest of transparency, letting the public or workers know if there is a pesticide that is about to be used. <clears throat> it's required three days before a treatment and up to with it has to remain four days after. Now, this may not be very applicable to you. And part of this depends on your conversation with Jen and, and the airport for, folks. Um, you know, this is really about parks. This is more oriented towards public spaces. <clears throat> However, um, uh, there are some built-in exceptions. So if you're talking about baits, which is I think probably what a lot of you are using for your rodent problems, um, you need a sign in the building where the pesticides are used. It can be at the main department office or somewhere just to let people who are using that building know that baits are in use. Okay, which is, uh, that doesn't have to be for every specific use. It just can be a general announcement if there are baits in place <coughs> that, uh, you know, to let people know. Um, 
uh, postings not required on rights of way that are not used by the public. Um, and I think most of these areas, your areas, are not used by the public. Um, tier three products, which is the really it's basically soaps and oils, uh, you don't have to have advanced um, posting on those if you're in a position where you have to post. And the big one here is you. there are areas where posting is not required. And um, that probably applies to a fair amount of wh where you are, um, uh, but it has to be something that we have on record. So these are generally areas in, inaccessible to the public where the only potential exposure is by the pest managers themselves. For example, we have lots of rights away that go across Central Valley and the only people who go there are the people managing vegetation. So of course they know that pesticides are being used. Um, now there are, I think some, <clears throat> there are a few exemptions for these sorts of areas and we might need to set some up for some airport areas as well. Uh, and Jen, you know, we can talk about this. We just have to know where posting is not required also. So for, for now, posting is required um, <clears throat> if you're gonna spray herbicides in an area where um, there are people other than pest managers who are gonna be there uh, or uh, you have to put up a sign about using baits in these facilities where you're using baits, um, and, and unless there's a specifically granted exemption. Does that make sense for everyone? It's a little, a little confusing. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like out in the parks. We have a specific sign that um, is not mandatory, but you can use it. It has all the required information on it. And that's also on our website. And now, Chris, I, I yeah. wanted to talk about the, yeah. you know, exemption and the posting requirements. Really, yeah. if if I understand correctly, the airport has only been given one exemption, and that's for runways, for our runways, right? Um, yeah. And that's due to, you know, safety. Obvious. And all of, you know, all of the obvious reasons, <clears throat> making sure, you know, signs can be read. Um, so I don't believe there's any other situation at the airport that has warranted uh, up to this point um, an exemption. So I just I do want to throw that out there for tenants. Yep. Um, yep. So it's very clear. And and it's um, I mean, this is a little bit bureaucratic. I know these are huge spaces with few people in them a, a lot of times, uh, more planes than people maybe, I, I don't know, I'm imagining. But um, <clears throat> we can do, we could put together a blanket exemption for some of these un, you know, non-populated areas where you may need to do treatments. Because posting is, it does take time, you know, it's a chore. Um, and if it's not serving a useful purpose, then why do it? So. Uh, we can talk separately about maybe setting up a blanket exemption on posting for certain kinds of areas, other areas at the airport, if that makes sense. Um, so um, for now, though, uh, yeah, it's the air, it's the airfield. It's FAA requirements it has to be treated and no one can go there anyway. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so. Um, that's posting record keeping. So the ordinance requires us to keep a uh, track of all pesticides used on city property. And we do that using a database, uh, a web enabled database. It's a simple thing where the, um, there is a defined set of people with passwords who enter the data every month. And we require it to be entered every month. <clears throat> um, it's called the pesticide use reporting system. And um, what we're going to do is um, we've already sort of put out the call for um, people who need a login in order to do this work from the various tenants at the airport. And what you should do is um, email me and make sure I acknowledge it. I'm getting I'm a little bit flooded with emails right now, but um, uh, what I'm going, what I'll do is I will set up um, passwords for uh, representatives from each tenant, preferably one person. It makes it easier if it's one. <clears throat> it can be you, someone in your group, or it can be your pest management contractor, whichever works for you. 
and I understand it may work easier if it's if it's someone on staff for some of you. So, um, and once you have your login, um, <clears throat> and this is this is in inside the database. It's not a very complicated thing, believe me. But there is a help document that has a full video training of how to use this. That's uh, that's there waiting for you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, wait, let's say about a week from now and get all the names that I have received from the tenants. Does that seem seem about right, Jen? About a week. <clears throat> and uh, and then I'll put out a blanket email uh, with uh, I'll give, send you your passwords and also point you to this video training. And then for follow ups, I'm available anytime. And if we wanted to do an in person, uh, you know, a live training, that's also possible. It's not very complicated, uh, but, you know, it's it's yet another tech tech tool that we have to get used to. So. And Chris, um, may I ask, so there are most of the or primarily all of the pest management companies that I believe our, our tenants here are using, um, they all have green certified or, you know, the three green certifications. Um, that mm -hmm. are needed. You don't necessarily have to use a company that has a certification, but it's always good to to contact your pest provider, make sure they're aware the airport is, you know, city and county of San Francisco, um, and perhaps even ask them if they can um, report, do the monthly reporting for your um, for your space. Um, again, I don't know if that would be an additional charge, um, and, and that is not, um, necessary, especially if it is an additional charge, but, um, it might help you, um, as a responsible leaseholder to ensure that they know what they're putting, you know, that they know the pesticides that they're, um, listing down as, um, for what they used in your space. Um, whereas I don't know if it's as easy for, you know, you receiving the report and just looking at it, if if that is, if, if those are good chemicals or bad chemicals. And we can, if, if, you, de if you do decide you want to be the one um, entering in the monthly data, completely fine. Our pest group will, um, review it afterwards and, and we will work with you all for the first few months to ensure compliance. Um, and, you know, so you can go back to your pest provider, but um, I, I did just want to throw that out there. Um, I, I'm not sure. Has anybody on this call <clears throat> reached out to your pest provider? Um, I'd be very curious to know what the, if, if that if you have what the pest providers are saying, um, that'll help us kind of work through any issues as well. I'm not hearing a response. Anyone? Okay. Well, um, okay. Uh, so yeah, you have multiple ways you can go about it then. And, um, it, you know, it's it's a hurdle that has to be jumped. It's part of the it's part of the compliance is to have this data. <clears throat> it also helps the airport um, in their accountability. They have to they're accountable for all of this all of this pesticide use on the property. So um, uh, it's part of their job too uh, to to have this data available. Um, so I'm wide open for questions on this. When if you're trying to get set up to use this PERS data system, once we get, get you the passwords. Um, uh, and I can set up a separate training if that's if that makes sense, or if you, you can't make head or tails out of the video training, that's fine. Um, so that that's one of the that's one of the big things that you have that you know you're gonna have to figure out. Um, just as an FYI, all of this feeds into a public dashboard showing pesticide use trends in the city. And tracking, you know, certain indicators, um, 
uh, over time, and um, it's it's all this is a very public issue. So um, we have done. So this is where we do a little bragging. It's been a pretty effective program in terms of uh, getting the the bad stuff off the list without sacrificing effective pest management. We've had a 97.9 reduction in the the most hazardous pesticides since 2010. Um, and this is in city limits. This actually doesn't include the airport on this particular bar graph, but um, <clears throat> uh, so you know it it is I think a, a functional program. Uh, and since 2015, it's been an 86 percent reduction. So um, and a lot of that is a lot of the progress is not readily visible because you can't see it. Uh, and that is we've taken nasty stuff off of the list, things that we don't need because we have safer alternatives. So don't worry, you don't have to remember these. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's, that is uh, the gist of it. Um, and the take home messages are, you know, IPM is S San Francisco and SFO policy. And we're trying to get everyone uh, onto this bandwagon uh, it's always been a challenge with the leases because it just gets more complicated. Um, <clears throat> when you are talking, I didn't talk about this much, but when you are dealing with your pest management contractors, um, it, it's good to be aware that calendar-based monitoring of pests is a good thing, but not calendar-based treatments. And this is the like the number one thing to watch out for from pest management companies is they will you know gladly sign you up to do calendar based sprays or whatnot uh, that are end up really not being necessary at all um, so that's something to watch out for um, look before you spray is kind of the, the shorthand for that <clears throat> um, pay attention to prevention there's lots of resources available for that and very important always check the current reduced risk pesticide list before applying pesticides. So this is a message that you have to, you know, pass on to your contractors that they are, this is what they're allowed to use here. <clears throat> and then all that use has to be recorded and submitted via that database. I showed you the PERS database. So you'll need to delegate someone either with the company or, or internally to enter the data. It doesn't take long. It's, it's not a huge lift, but it's, just one of those things we have to do. <clears throat> it's also good to keep in mind, it's all public. Everything, um, if you ever get an exemption or if you uh, all your pesticide usage is, is in the public domain. Um, and then uh, finally, we have lots of resources on this available and I've put some of them into this, <clears throat> into this PowerPoint, which I'm, I'm sharing with you all. Um, uh, they're all on this uh, sfenvironment.org page, the reduced risk pesticide list, the compliance checklist. Also, the data entry link to get into PERS is located there. There's a link for filing exemptions, which hopefully you won't need. And then there's lots of the pest prevention by design guidelines as well. Um, so that is, that's, <laughs> that's the, the training. And I'm going to turn off the recording now um, and ask if you have, if there are any questions. This is a, 